Dear colleagues, dear friends, welcome to sixth webinar of ECOMOS uh, International Cultural Heritage uh, Underwater Cultural Heritage Committee. Uh, and now, uh, I guess, uh, Chris Underwood, who is the president of uh, ECOMOS ICUC, will speak something. Then, uh, Chris, I guess you will read the uh, biography of uh, our first speaker, isn't it? I will, yes, absolutely, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Um, in the past, I've been saying good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and that usually covers all the bases. Um, wherever you are, you're very welcome, and uh, thank you for joining us on the, the sixth webinar. And uh, here we are, Hakan, we're almost halfway through. Incredible. Um, we've had some fantastic speakers in the past, the past five and the two today what I find absolutely absorbing is that um, our speaker from um, Vietnam Le Thi Lien is going to talk about um, something that's very dear to my heart and that's really engaging with the with the public and later uh, Mariano is going to be talking about in situ preservation and what I would say at the beginning is that sometimes you think these things aren't related, but they're absolutely totally related in the sense that we've long since been aware, and I'm not going to spoil um, Mariano's intro, in, uh, in saying that in-situ preservation is very closely linked to what we do in public engagement. Um, just to introduce uh, Li Lien, she was a senior researcher at the Institute yeah. of Archaeology. Um, between 1985 and 2017. She's currently the senior expert at the IA, that's the Institute of Archaeology, and is executive member of Vietnam Association of Archaeology, VAA. Uh, she's a member of ICOMOS ICUCHA's Bureau. I'm very happy to have her on board for that. She's uh, editorial board member of SPAFA, uh, the SPAFA Journal, and I can't remember the what the acronym is totally, but basically SPAFA is a an organization that deals with archaeology and underwater cultural heritage and cultural heritage in the South Asian region. Um, she, following the completion of her MA course in Indian archaeology, and again, that's quite diverse and must be quite different to Vietnam, and ancient history, um, and that was at the MS University of Baroda in India, for, and that, that for, led to a PhD in Buddhist and Hindu art of Southern Vietnam, how fascinating that must be too. She continues to research on Buddhism and Hinduism um, in, in Vietnam and Southeast Asia. What else can I say? I'm reading off my, my phone here. She's involved in Southern Vietnam maritime archeology, span archeology span of the naval battlefields of which I'm quite familiar and had some little input to a year or two ago. She has published widely, including a book on Buddhist and Hindu art in the Kulong River Delta prior to the 10th century AD in Vietnamese and more than 80 chapters and pa uh, papers in Vietnamese and English. What a broad background, Lee, um, absolutely fascinating. And today you're gonna to be speaking about, let me just find you on my, my list here, about the role of local people in the preservation and propagation of underwater cultural heritage in Vietnam. Okay, the, the floor is yours. Yeah, okay. So I open the share screen. Oh. Yes, please. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so can you see it now? Yes, now we see. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Have you have to start back. the presentation. Oh. Yeah, hi, good yeah. morning. I'm just entering, but morning, Chris. Yeah. Good morning. Dark, yeah. I try. Yes. Ah, sorry. Hi. I try. Yeah. I try to see where, where it is now. Can you see? I don't know where it is. You're in your first page yeah, if, if you go to the first page and go to um where does it say slideshow you should so be able can to you start. see 
can you see it uh, in your in your screen? Yes, we can. I hope. But you need to start the slideshow. We can see it in a different view. Oh. I think lead is not connected right now. Yeah. We've lost it. Coach meeting is um... Lee, can you hear us? Ah. Lee, share your screen again, I think. You need to do that. Lee, on the, on the top bar, you have slideshow. Do that. And you need to click on slideshow. On your, Lee, can you hear me? Yes, I see. On, on the top of your screen, just below the, the upper edge of your presentation, you can see a label saying slideshow. It's a, the fifth one along, I think. No, the upper line. Go to your right, yes, what? up. Now you need to go up. It's at the top, then keep going, keep going. Yeah, click on that. And then click from first slide. Now I think you need to go back to slideshow. Go, go to your right, uh, slideshow. Keep going right, click on, on slideshow, and then the first one from the beginning. Okay, click okay. That's it, good. Yeah. Lee, you need to, I think, now unmute yourself. You need unmute. Hakan, can you do it from your end? Oh, can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Okay, now okay. you can start. Yeah, so you can uh, see the map of Vietnam with many uh, circles to show the coastline communities uh, who left many things to us. And nowadays we have many uh, cultural heritage and particularly the underwater uh, with a long uh, coastline and many uh, Iceland capes, large and small bays, and a number of river system. So with this uh, circle, you can see the red one like in, in the north is uh, in the Hong River Delta. Uh, several river mouths are uh, open in this area to create a good uh, place for landing and uh, uh, developing of the ancient port and uh, uh, settlement. The same in central Vietnam with very important area in the Thu River Valley. 
And in South Vietnam, in the Dong Nai River Valley, and after that, it developed into the uh, the development of uh, the Delta, Mekong Delta, uh, with the contribution of Mekong River uh, in this area. So uh, at least from 4,500 to 3,500 uh, uh, years BP, we have many uh, coast, uh, coastal community who uh, uh, leave their cultural heritage for us. So for example, in Northern Vietnam, in the uh, what we call Tonkin, uh, 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 Gulf of Tonkin here, uh, we can see many uh, uh, cultural heritage live in the island or the coastal area. For example, in this area, we have the remain of the ancient uh, people from the 5,000 to 3,000, thousand year PP, uh, they use a small uh, artifact micro list like this um, to uh, uh, exploit the sea uh, uh, food, uh, sea fish, uh, something like that in what we call Dong Choi Sai, uh, which is uh, recently discovered. And this area also where the, uh, we developed a, uh, the ancient part uh, with the internet, international um, uh, role in the uh, 11th century, we call Vendon uh, International Port. So this is a very important uh, point to connect the Southern people with uh, China and uh, further to the North it, during the first uh, millennium uh, CE. And uh, around this area in the uh, Iceland, you can see nowadays how the people live on the Iceland and live on the sea like this. And in the old time, they uh, seem to have the same way of living. That's why a lot of uh, remains has been left there uh, with the Kaibel culture. And also in the river mouth, like here in uh, Changking side, we have evidence of the exchange of the material from the prehistoric periods. And also in the metal periods, we have many evidence, for example, the Bose uh, burial, which the artifact, uh, which show the context and exchange of the people from the uh, China's, uh, and also some evidence of southern, uh, southeast or south, even South Asian uh, countries. And we think that it may be a, a very strong community stay here uh, who uh, uh, occupied this area during the first millennium BC. And uh, during the first millennium BC and the first millennium AD, uh, Vietnam has been an import, important note on the maritime trading routes. And uh, you can see the realm of three main cultural uh, in Vietnam that share many uh, uh, cultural heritage with other tied to the maritime trading network. In the North, we have the uh, Dung Son culture in the Hong River Valley uh, Ma'a River Valley and Ka, or Lam River Valley here. So uh, I will show you more evidence uh, for this. And in central Vietnam, uh, in the Cham, uh, later Cham civilization, but earlier in the South Wing cultural sites, we have many uh, evidence of the contact and uh, trading uh, in this area. And also in the uh, Khánh Hòa, Bình Định, Phú Yên area, in this area, uh, we have a long um, tradition of uh, trading, uh, which contacts the people of prehistory and also the history periods to uh, contribute to the formation of Cham civilization and then uh, later on in Vietnamese uh, um, Viet uh, periods. And in South Vietnam, particularly with the state, uh, early state uh, formation periods, uh, particularly the Funan, uh, which play a very important role in the 
development of the state in Southeast Asia. Uh, you can see many sites of the pre of L and of L archaeological culture during the first million BC to around second to seventh century CE. Yeah, this is what they found in many sites in uh, northern Vietnam and southern Vietnam. Uh, for Đông Sơn culture, um, you can see that this uh, bronze artifact like bronze drum or bronze eggs and uh, knives like this uh, has been attracted by the looter or uh, uh, antique uh, dealer in all time. And of course, in one side, uh, we have many things uh, valuable like uh, pottery and many other, but they focus to this. That's why sometimes the people uh, sell it and uh, become the looters. And also the looter try to find this thing. In another area, like in Sawing area, Sawing site, uh, expose this kind of thing that strikes the uh, looter. Of course, this thing found from the uh, archaeology uh, site. But the main thing uh, become the, uh, which become the, um, things sold in the markets uh, are the gold or the bees and like this. And the same thing like this, um, we found in archeological site. And in any case, if the people find, they can choose this thing and they left the, uh, uh, like a pottery and other things. And they sold this to the markets. And in one case, when we come and explain to the farmer in one site, they said that, oh, if I understand the meaning of this artifact, like cultural meaning or historical meaning, we will keep it, we will not sell it. It means that many people, when they touch uh, or they found this thing on the site, they never know about the history or uh, cultural value of the thing. And they just think that, oh, it's a hole, and they sold it for the daily life or something like that. And uh, the same happened uh, in the 1940, when many people come to find this thing to sell because many of them are made from gold, um, like this one, the ring uh, with the Nandi uh, image like this. And Mallory tried to uh, purchase from the people. That's why he come to know about one famous city in the southern Vietnam. Yeah, so there are many kind of uh, sites uh, appear along the coast. And in the north, you can see that the uh, Vendon port here, which uh, exposed uh, many things like uh, the Chinese ceramic or the terracotta uh, um, model of the stupa like this. And in case of the knowledge people who know about the um, ancient part, who is the uh, hometown, uh, which, which is the hometown of these people, and they will keep it for memory of their own history. But in many cases, the people just think that the thing is sold for money. For example, the uh, ceramic found from the uh, Great Cham Seaport in central Vietnam, uh, uh, it has been used at the uh, um, the souvenir or at first they keep in house for memory of the past uh, before the 1990. But after the 1990 with the development of tourism and sometimes the people come and try to find this as a souvenir. So it become a car, a type of uh, good to sell in the market. And in South Vietnam, uh, with uh, many things, uh, as I told in the previous uh, slide, you can see that under the uh, rice field like this, uh, the archaeologists found a city. But before uh, the archaeologists come, the people have uh, dig in this area to get gold for selling. And they keep some uh, like uh, other things like the statue and worship it in the, in the local uh, pagoda. So it means that when the people not very understand about the history, they 
just see it as a goal or valuable thing to sell for money. Yeah, uh, so uh, we can see that uh, the cultural heritage in general and particularly underwater cultural heritage firstly found by the local people. And uh, as I told you that some very proud with the things they understand, for example, for example this uh, man, very proud that this is the stake found from the battlefield of back down uh, battlefield this is uh, this is the side of the victory of uh, Vietnamese to uh, fight with the Mongolian war in the 13th century and the people in this area including him very proud of their history and when they found this uh, state they inform us and they very uh, happy to work with us to keep this and in another case, when the people find the, like a statue of the god or Buddha, they worship in the small shrine like this. But if the people say that, oh, this is valuable for money, then they, some people would uh, uh, take it away to sell for money. In another case, for example, these people, they found the cannon on the uh, Thuận An port, uh, Hue, in central Vietnam, and they don't know about the cannon, what the period, what the value, and the police come and say that, oh, you, you take this from the sea and it is, uh, it is a cultural heritage of the country, and the police may take away and just uh, pay them some money for like a, a for their work, and they feel unhappy because they feel that oh, uh, it can be sold to uh, other uh, to the antique dealer with the bigger money. So they just think of the money. They don't know that it is more important to keep this for the uh, display or understand about the, the the past or history. And uh, in another case, when uh, this man. Uh, his father found an artifact in the river. They keep in the house for a long time as a, a kind of memory of the uh, history of the country. Even he don't know very clearly about the um, period of this thing. Or in many cases, the people reuse the artifact they found from the uh, area, like a uh, both fragment like this, the sheet blank, uh, they reuse it as a, 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 a watering place in uh, South Vietnam. Uh, so in this case, I'd like to show you that the people understand very little about the thing they found. If they understand more about the history, particularly of their homeland, they would be very proud and they want to keep this. And this is a case. Mr. Nguyen Thay Yên in Vendon uh, International Park, he found many things in this area. And also he got it from the local people who found it. And he keep it in his house. Uh, and he show us, you can see here the picture of an ancient pot that uh, uh, drawn by a foreign people and they copy it, keep in the house, and they keep all the thing in this area. Even they don't know what it is, what it belong, what belong, uh, what periods it belong. So um, we can see that uh, many ways they uh, uh, treat to, to the thing they found. For example, in this case, um, the people just find out the kennel. In general, they they don't think this is valuable. And for the antique dealer, they also think that it's no use. So the people from the museum can get it and bring back to the museum to display. But in general, the thing will be sold. For example, the gold will be uh, gold or the ceramic, the complete one like this will be sold to um, big dealer 
for example, in Ho Chi Minh City, uh, some fragment like this, uh, they will, the farmer or the fisherman will sell it with a very small price or even throw away. So in this case, one um, person who very uh, proud of the of his uh, historical uh, place or his hometown, Mr. Lam Du Seng, he tried to collect this and keep in the house. And even when they found the people, the fishermen found the plank of uh, shipwreck, they want to uh, reuse it for the um, furniture in the house. So Mr. Lam Du Seng tried to collect it and keep in uh, his house. And uh, in, uh, uh, he pay them for money and sometimes he give them another wood to make the furniture. And also the thing has been kept in his house. Of course, he, many people will not think that this is a good, uh, valuable wood for antique markets. That why, that's why they may sell with uh, like a cheap price. And why there are many looters and also unintentional looters in the area recently and particularly after uh, 1995. You can see that this is one antique shop in Hoi An, uh, which, uh, in which you can find many artifacts from the shipwreck, like the, uh, from the Hoi An shipwreck. And in the another, area in Hue, you can see the people saw many things on the uh, streets like this, even uh, the stone tool also, and we don't know where it come from. And uh, in this case, the fisherman who helped us to make, uh, to make a survey in uh, Binh Chau, Quang Ngai province, he told us that they found the ceramic in the sea and they sell it. Uh, they sell it for money to pay for um, uh, the children to go to school. And uh, we try to explain that. Oh, please don't sell that. Uh, you better keep it and send it to the museum, so your children will learn from that, and they they can uh, uh, have a better result of the study. Of course, uh, in some cases it's useful, but in many cases it's very difficult if the people are too poor and they need money. So we have to find another way to help them. And uh, they will help us, for example, to do research, to survey and show us the area where they found the thing. Yeah, so problem uh, of the uh, many signs that they found the artifact. Uh, in general, the people who found the artifact uh, and keep it in the house without the proper uh, conservative treatment, or they just keep the uh, broken one uh, in their house like this. So after some time, everything become bad. For example, the wood like this, or the cost has been damaged uh, uh, heavily. Or uh, even one book, uh, we cannot read it now. So almost no information can be kept in this book. Yeah. And another thing is that they cannot record the artifact properly. And even they just keep in the mind that, oh, I found this from this area, I found these things from another area, and not correctly. So what are the solutions for raising awareness and responsibility of the local people? So we try to do uh, something. First, we try to look at the government policy. Yes, the policy have many things to say about how uh, to keep the thing, how to uh, twist the artifact when the, you find the thing uh, suddenly on the farm or under the water, you can send it to the museum. So the, the government or the cultural staff 
will uh, uh, will have the award or something or pay some money for them. But as these people complain, um, they have been paid with a very small number. And in another case in Northern Vietnam, when they found a very big ship of 17th century, uh, the people get it and pay also very small amount of money that not enough uh, for uh, paying the worker. Because generally the people try to find the, 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 the thing to sell for money or even suddenly they found the, the metal, for example, they will sell it to the people who collect the old thing. And uh, when they try to get it, they pay for worker. And when the people, the government pay them with the smaller, uh, smaller money, they will not feel happy and they will try to find someone who pay more. This is one problem. So this thing in the uh, law of Vietnam is good, but uh, generally it not uh, work everywhere uh, in some area and some side important and some side that has been recognized by the government only. So in some case, uh, for example, the fisherman says that, oh, I'm not digging it. I just, uh, the, it, uh, the thing come to uh, my network only. So in that way, we can do nothing. Yeah, and in the uh, degree, uh, Article 24.3, they also says that it is strictly forbidden to buy and sell relic and antique of illegal origin. So as I tell you that, uh, when something come to the fish net of the people, they sold it and no one can check it illegal or not, have the clear origin or not. And it's very interesting in one case that in Hội An, uh, antique shop, you can see that many very beautiful ceramics like this has been sold with the note here written like this. Oh, uh, this is Tudor antique ceramic of 15th, 16th century. And um, this has... Sorry, I interrupt. Our duration yeah. is uh, almost finished. And it yeah, will be okay. really nice if you finish in one minute. Okay. Yeah. So we try to do we try to contact with the government, with the officer, with the people who uh, protect the uh, uh, coastal area and with the people try to explain to them. And we try to contact with the local people and ask help from them and explain the value of things to them as in this case. And uh, uh, we also try to train people to understand uh, what is the meaning of the um, underwater cultural heritage and uh, also the main way to preserve or to uh, uh, propagate is uh, with the NAS training for local people. And uh, also we try to uh, bring uh, the people, uh, their tradition with the uh, uh, side of underwater uh, side like this. And uh, recently we try to encourage the people to join in the research and uh, on site conservation and try to open the uh, reconstruction area and uh, on site conservation for the people to understand more about this. And of course, we also try to uh, talk and to discuss with the leader and manager to find the best way and more expectation that uh, in Vietnam, uh, underwater archaeology uh, is, uh, is still in very first state and we lack a lot of things like the researchers and infrastructure and finance. So we expect this thing like a closer con cooperation between local people, researcher and authority and uh, the state investment to uh, uh, this field. And also we think that we need to do more a trip way of interpretation and promotion of 
under water controller has heritage to the public and so on. And I hope that this way will make people more proud about the, uh, their history and their country, underwater cultural heritage. And this is the way that we can protect it better and uh, uh, make it more valuable for people and for researchers. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, so I finish. Yeah, thank you, Lee. Um, I think because of the time, we should uh, move quickly on to Mariano. Are you, are you there? Yes, I am. Are, are you okay to continue? Yes, of course. Fantastic. Uh, <coughs> Akan, are you going to introduce Mariano? Yes, of course. Okay, over to you, sir. Uh, thank you. Um, actually, he has a very long um, biography, and I'm just making it quite shorter. Since 2008, uh, Mariana is professor of public international law at the University of Jerome, one. But his interest on underwater cultural heritage began earlier, still being associate professor at the University of Valencia, when Spain had to face the first judicial international cases against treasure hunters. This coincided with the first project and the beginning of the negotiation, which finally drew to the adoption in 2001 of the UNESCO Convention on the Protection of Underwater Cultural Heritage. Uh, Mariana holds a doctorate in law by the University of Valencia, has been visited pro professor in different universities in Spain, Italy, and France, and also been visited fellow at the University of Cambridge, where he is life member of Claire Hill College, founder member of the European Society of International Law and member of its board. Mariano is editor in chief of the Spanish yearbook book International Law since um, 2013. He is also a consultant scholar of Cultural Heritage Center at Penn University and patron of Spanish National Museum of Underwater Cultural Heritage and member of Ecomos IFA. Thank you. Yes, Mariana, it's your yeah. turn. Yeah, I will share my screen. If you are okay, just let me know if you can see it properly. Yes, we, we see in the moment. Okay. So first of all, thank you uh, to Ikuch and uh, most particularly, um, to Hakan and Chris um, for the organization of this fantastic series of uh, webinars. And of course, thanks to Hakan for his kind introduction. Um, thanks also to all of you attending this webinar this morning, afternoon, or evening. I don't know exactly. For me, it's uh, almost evening. Um, my lecture to this uh, today will be uh, on uh, the in situ rule in the 2001 UNESCO Convention. I make a um, on the title uh, as loss in translation because most of the problems around the in situ rule uh, from a legal perspective in these uh, initial um, years of the leaving of our convention is uh, has created some misunderstandings about the meaning of, of what does it mean. And, and I, we may wonder why these again, why must we still be talking about the in situ rule? Well, in uh, recommendation number seven of the evaluation of the 2001 convention uh, undertaken by the International Oversight Service, um, invited the um, scientific and, te and technical advisory body, the STAB, the convention to clarify the archaeological concepts of the 2001 convention, such as in situ preservation. This was also uh, said um, by resolution number two of the STAB first extraordinary meeting um, uh, held in Algiers in 2009. 
uh, where it was decided to propose to the meeting of the state parties a clarification of certain concepts used by the 2001 convention, such as the ones related to in situ preservation. The same was said in the recommendation of the staff in 2020 uh, in order to, to make uh, an examination of paragraphs 37 to 40 of the operational guidelines of the convention, um, keeping in mind that in the preparatory works of the uh, convention, um, it, uh, it, it was important, uh, the recognition of two challenges. Um, the first, the challenge to ensure proper conservation and storage of artifacts recovered from the water and the importance of the interplay, interplay between the site and its context. So um, still, there is a still doubt about the uh, exact legal meaning of the in situ preservation rule, which needs to be clarified. Uh, even the, the, the particular meeting held by the staff last month of February this year um, also show that uh, there is still remains uh, um, and some concerns about the extent and the um, legal meaning of the uh, in situ rule. In my case, and after Martin Manda's excellent presentation um, from an archaeological perspective uh, in the last se session of these webinars, um, I will try to explain in perhaps a more boring uh, conversation mm -hmm. with you um, the, the, the question and the place of the in situ rule from an, a strict legal perspective. That is what it is said on this, on, 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 under this legal perspective in the convention on the in situ uh, rule. Well, as you know, the, the rule is um, condensed in uh, article two, paragraph five and in rule number one of the annex. And two particular questions um, have created some concerns for, in, in the different um, authentic uh, versions of the convention. First, uh, the term uh, preservation, and second, the meaning and uh, extent of the idea or the concept of first option. Well, uh, if this is in the, in the English authentic text of the convention, uh, the same could be said in the Spanish authentic text. Uh, the term uses preservación, which is quite common, uh, similar to preservation in English, and or but, when talking about first option in the Spanish authentic test, it's said opción prioritaria, which is more or less the same, which is said in the French authentic text, which also use uh, this idea of opción prioritaire. Uh, but when dealing with the term preservation, it uses the term conservation, conservation. So, Preservation, conservation on the one hand, and on the other hand, a first option, option prioritaire, option prioritaria. But does, uh, does all these terms mean the same or not? Well, for the correct interpretation of all these um, terms, we must not forget that the UNESCO Convention is just a treaty, is a treaty, an international agreement. And as such, it is governed by international law, which includes these, uh, the general rules of treaty interpretation. And these rules have been codified in articles 31 and to 33 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. And then we must use these rules in order to interpret the exact meaning of the uh, in situ preservation rule. How can we do it? Well, if we use um, Article 33, which deals with the interpretation of treaties authenticated in two or more languages, which is our case, do not forget that the UNESCO Convention has been authenticated in six different languages, the six official languages of uh, UNESCO and of the UN system, including English, French, Spanish, but also Arabic, Russian, and Chinese. Well, in this case, what are the rules to be applied in order to, 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 uh, to see what is the, the exact meaning and extent of, of the in situ rule? 
Okay, the first rule is that when our treaty has been authenticated in two or more languages, they are equally authoritative in each language, unless the treaty provides, and I agree that in case of divergence, a particular text shall prevail, which is not our case. All and every six authentic versions are exactly the same. So uh, there is no um, um, prevailing uh, text among the six authentic texts, not the English, not the French, not the Russian one. So what to do? Then it is a um, fiction which says that the terms of the treaty are presumed to have the same meaning in each authentic text. And when a comparison of the authentic text discloses a different meaning, the meaning which best reconciles the text having regard to the object and purpose of the treaty shall be adopted. And I do believe that there is um, no strong differences between the, um, at least the three authentic texts most used in um, the um, convention so far, which is English, Spanish, and French. Does mean that preservation in English, preservación in Spanish, and conservación in French do mean exactly the same. And this is exactly what occurs with the other concern regarding the term first option. First option it is to be adopted the idea that it does mean exactly the same that option prioritaria in Spanish, option prioritaire in French. In Arabic, if I'm not wrong, and if Google Translator is not wrong either, um, the terms used in uh, Arabic authentic text, it's also preservation and first option, but perhaps those of you native Arabic speakers could correct me. And um, it could be very good for future involvements on, on future stakeholders, some feedback from uh, Chinese and Russian versions uh, in order to clarify. But so far, what we can say is that these terms mm, meaning are exactly the same from a legal perspective. I know, for example, that in environmental law, um, uh, conservation means uh, sustainable use and management of natural resources by and for human beings, while preservation attempts to maintain in the present condition areas of the earth that are so far untouched by humans, aside um, native uh, people. I didn't, I'm not sure whether this um, distinction between conservation and preservation could, could be translated in uh, or, or made an analogous distinction in heritage law. But in principle, and so far, uh, for our interest now with regard to the uh, interpretation of this term, conservation uh, on preservation, and first option and option prioritaire, um, the legal meaning in the convention is, is exactly the same. Um, meaning which needs to be checked with the general rule of interpretation endorsed and uh, declared by Article 31 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Then the meaning to be given to the terms in, of, of the treaty in their context and keeping in mind the object and proposed. These are the rules uh, for uh, a correct interpretation in good faith of uh, the terms of a treaty. And with regard, particularly the question of first, first option, option prioritaria, option prioritaire, uh, the term option must and shall be interpreted in accordance with the ordinary meaning to be given to this term. And that option is just that, an option. It is not a total or a, um, uh, an, a, a principle imposed imposing an obligation with no exceptions. Um, it is true that um, in order to, to keep in mind the context to interpret these uh, terms, uh, the, um, the preamble and the annexes uh, of the convention could be also 
uh, be uh, kept in mind. Um, and uh, as we have already said, um, rule number one of the annex also points in this direction. It is true that any other agreement relating to the treaty, which uh, was made between all the parties in connection with the conclusion of the treaty, may also be used for the interpretation, but this is not our case. It is um, uh, not our case either, um, the existence of any instrument which was made by one or more parties in connection with the conclusion of the treaty and accepted by the other treaties. So it is not useful for us, this rule in Article uh, 31, paragraph 2 of the Vienna um, Convention. But it is useful for our interpretation from a legal perspective, the subsequent practice in the application of the um, treaty regarding its interpretation, because um, no special meaning was given to um, first option or preservation um, um, when uh, the uh, convention was negotiated. But what shows us this subsequent practice, which it is quite limited, but at least may shed some light on the interpretation of the rule. First, we have the uh, operational guidelines. And in uh, the uh, chapter devoted, uh, uh, in the operational guidelines, these guidelines in all three authentic texts that I'm using, English, French, and Spanish, points in the same di direction. But there is a, a second point of subsequent practice, which is included in the um, staff evaluation report in the Panama mission in 2015, which particularly address the question of these uh, problems of translation uh, between the English, the Spanish and the French text in the footnote uh, number 26 of the report. And it says that, uh, and clarified that there is no contradiction between the different languages uh, meanings and that the contextual interpretation uh, of the in situ rule taken into account in particular the annex uh, rule one, but also rules three to five also goes in this idea of giving the same meaning to the um, text. And uh, in particular with regard to the question of first option, it is said in line with what is agreed in uh, rule number one of the annex that states that only in cases in which um, um, the, the, the scientific removal is considered appropriate um, or a better protection or danger of the site will in situ preservation cease to be the first or priority option. This was said by the staff in this report and this was endorsed by the meeting of the state parties. So this is subsequent practice which from a legal perspective um, helps to clarify the exact meaning of uh, the terms. Let me conclude with some um, ideas, general uh, ideas. It is true that the rule number one of the annex was not adopted by consensus, but by a wide majority. Um, in, but regardless of this, in situ preservation is today uh, an archeologically generally accepted principle by stakeholders and particularly by the international scientific um, community. But there are no legal divergences among the different authentic uh, versions of the 2001 convention, uh, if interpreted uh, in good faith under the international rules of interpretation of the treaties. Third main idea is that in situ preservation is the first option, not necessarily the preferred option always. Uh, alternatives may be imposed by an immediate and severe danger or a, by a significant contribution to protection, knowledge, or by the enhancement of underwater cultural heritage. So the in situ rule, it is not an absolute principle, could be, and it is the first option, but not the unique option. Actually, it is an an option. Because uh, as I said at the very beginning, and um, 
Martin Manders in um, its uh, webinar um, also said, the question of the in situ rule, it, it, it's just to link our past and our future. The context, it was, um, can we read of what happened yesterday? And to keep it will permit us to have the best knowledge tomorrow of uh, the underwater cultural heritage. So today we need the in situ option, which is an in situ choice to permit the context arrive to the future in order to um, make it as perfect as possible, our knowledge and understanding of the underwater cultural heritage. For these, it is important, of course, the technical advice of the specialist, but also as, our, as uh, Lee have just shown in his uh, fantastic uh, presentation on Vietnam and the water cultural heritage and the role to be played by uh, local people, the social involvement is necessary to finally arrive to the political decision on the in situ choice in each particular case. In situ conservation, preservation, I use here, um, don't panic, the, the term conservation instead of preservation in order to play with the words because in situ conservation is an in situ conversation with the site and with the local communities, a continuous conversation in order to keep the context of, of yesterday for the knowledge of uh, tomorrow. Thank you very much for your... Um... Thank you very much, Mariana. It was a very nice presentation. Uh, and you showed that only one word is how much important for us. Uh, thank you again. And uh, if uh, some of us wish to ask some questions, we have several minutes, actually. In my opinion, Chris can ask something. Yeah. Ask something. Is that of Mariano or of Lee as well? Yeah. Do I have a choice? Um, absolutely. Can I, or can I just make a statement linking the two presentations? Yes, because you can do that. Yeah. I, I said at the very beginning that I, I said that in situ preservation and what Lee has been doing in Vietnam and other people do in different uh, parts of the world, it's inextricably linked. And in fact, Martin and myself wrote in the foundation course manual that in situ preservation has become a, a benediction in the sense that it's one of our go-to rules. It, and as Hakan said, it's extremely important, but it's also been a barrier to social inclusion in the sense that when we preserve something in situ, we, in most cases, are covering it and it's not so easy to enjoy, uh, for the public to enjoy. So it's become a little cross for us to bear. And particularly the point made by those that would prefer to commercially exploit is that we are preventing the public from enjoying their heritage and by digging it up as they would like to do, enables the public to enjoy their, that heritage. Unfortunately, often the case and what they don't say is that the heritage that they recover is distributed amongst individuals and it's not really kept as a collection. And I think the thing that um, the last slide of Mariano's, which was most impactful, was in situ providing that link between yesterday's knowledge and tomorrow's knowledge. And that is an extremely powerful statement in demonstrating why in situ preservation is so important. And I'm sure if Martin, I don't know whether he's listening, but if Martin was here, it provides you with a, a breather, a breathing point while you decide what you do with the site. And there are many options and I'm sure Martin and others who have uh, given um, preservations or management related um, presentations would make very clear. And I think what is important for people to understand as Mariano also made clear is that preservation in situ is only one option. It's our preferred go-to option but where there are other issues, then it is not the only option by any means. And I think I'm going to repeat um, something that was said by 
by Taras Molovel, is that the science of archaeology is an important component here, and we must not lose sight of that. You know, we must not just bury everything and, you know, use the argument that things are left in situ for future generations. That is not the point here. It's a value judgment, and we make the decisions based on the, uh, the knowledge we have at a particular point in time about what to do with a site. So I, that's what I meant by in situ preservation and public engagement and, and ensuring the public fully value, but it's social and cultural value, it's historical, archaeological value, not what it means in terms of a, an artifact on somebody's shelf that is no longer shared heritage. Thank you. I hope that sort of puts some perspective on the two presentations. Thank you. Thank you for linking these things, very important. And still uh, many things that we still try to find a way to solve why we work with the people and uh, a specific site. Um, if there is one more question, uh, probably we have uh, time on, for one question. Okay, it seems uh, there is no question. I just want to give some brief information about our YouTube account, these presentations, and earlier presentations to our, uh, will be ready tomorrow, actually. The earlier presentations are ready at YouTube in um, Comos iCoach account, and this one also will be ready tomorrow. And thank you again to our both colleagues and our president, Chris Underwood. And this is the uh, uh, end of the meeting. Chris, would you like to say the end words? Yeah, thank you, Hakan and uh, Chris, for uh, uh, organizing this thing. Yeah, thank you all for listening. Thank you. And my final words are we look forward to seeing everybody in next time. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Thank bye you for bye. being being.